We're joined on INSEAD Knowledge by Martin Jakes, the author of a new book called When China Rules the World, The Rise of the Middle Kingdom and the End of the Western World. It's a pretty bleak uh, subheading there. It's about the end of the Western world. I don't regard it to be bleak myself. I mean, I, I don't mean by the end of the Western world that the Western world is, uh, is going to disappear or something, uh, as the West. But the, what I mean is the decline of a world which is dominated by the West. I, I view that with a certain amount of uh, uh, distance, really, because I'm try trying to understand what I think the historical processes are that are operating, uh, have, have been operating and are likely to operate in the future, and what their uh, consequence might be. And you're saying that it's when China rules the world, not if. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> so it seems to be it makes a better title. <laughs> it makes inexorable, it, um, rise. Well, of it China. makes partly because it just for the purposes of a title of a book, which of course is never um, a precise uh, reflection, unless it's in highly academic circles of exactly what the content of it is. It, I, th I think it works better. But um, I think it's not certain, but quite likely that uh, China will become the dominant well, dominant power in the world, not just economically, but politically and culturally. You are expecting China to emulate the rise of the US, um, but not just in economic terms, as you say, but you are expecting China to overtake the US. Is that, is that certain? No, it's not certain. Nothing is ever certain. But um, there's a consensus of economic projections from the likes of Goldman Sachs and PricewaterhouseCoopers and so on, uh, amongst others, that uh, around about uh, 2027, uh, China, the Chinese economy, will exceed uh, the economic size of the United States. And that then will have uh, implications for politics, for well, the military security situation. The overwhelming discussion about China has been about its economic impact. Uh, there's a, now a, 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 a rapidly expanding China, Chinese, China literature in, in your, any bookshop you want to go to, and, uh, but it's overwhelmingly about um, economic, uh, China's economic rise. Um, and I think this is extraordinary, really, because there seems to be an underlying assumption that China's impact should only be th thought of in economic terms. Um, when historically it's perfectly clear that the economic rise of a country is the prelude to it exercising much greater political, cultural, military influence and so on. And um, this will certainly be the case with China because uh, uh, on the assumption that it, uh, uh, that, for example, Goldman Sachs projection is that by 2050 the Chinese economy will be almost twice the size of the American economy. Now, there will be profound political and cultural repercussions for this, unless you think, and I think there is, how has been, a widespread Western assumption that as China modernizes, it will become just like us. Now, if you think it's going to be just like us, then it will just be, as it were, another Western country. Personally, I think this is quite wrong. It is interesting that you're saying that we shouldn't be looking to see how China develops along Western lines, but it will go along its uh, own course. Um, I think as Deng Xiaoping would have said, it would have been with Chinese characteristics that you would have this sort of uh, development. In terms of that development, though, how do you see the institutions of China developing? Um, you say you expect a far more representative government than there is now. Um, or administration in place. How how do you see things progressing politically? politically yeah. There have been quite big changes actually over the last um, uh, 10, 20 years. China's become um, uh, much more open. Um, the boundaries of discussion have uh, expanded enormously, mainly through the internet. Um, in a way, uh, the political institutions have become more uh, defined and codified. Um, uh, and less arbitrary. Uh, uh, in certain areas, there's not the rule of law, but the, the rule by law to a much greater extent, particularly in economic matters and so on. So there have been very big changes, and I would imagine that process will continue into the future. 
so that China will become increasingly uh, uh, accountable and uh, open uh, and in a sense representative. The people will enjoy a much bigger voice uh, over lots of questions. Um, and I think in time, I mean, this is very speculative, but I think in time probably China will uh, move in the direction of uh, universal suffrage and you know maybe uh, other parties and, and so on. So uh, th and that looks in some ways as if it might be more familiar uh, to the to Western eyes. But I think that uh, any notion of Chinese democracy will always be uh, very much uh, shaped by Chinese culture and Chinese history. I don't think that, uh, just like Japanese democracy, despite what people think in the West about Japanese democracy, Japanese democracy is very different. It works in profoundly different ways. Legitimacy in Japan does not really, uh, or sovereignty does not really reside with the people, even though they have regular elections, but it resides with the state. And I think this will certainly continue to be the case in China, because the Chinese state is the heart of China and has been for you know, hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, and so I think that uh, the development of universal suffrage in those kind of circumstances will still produce a different constellation of, uh, of uh, power uh, to what we're familiar with in the West. As I understand it now, there you get uh, grassroots participation, uh, maybe at a village or town level that uh, people are taking part in electing a mayor and maybe on a platform. Um, but uh, you, you say in you say in your book that um, at the top uh, level strata of the leadership, it has become more transparent. But you also say it's become more accountable, which. I found somewhat surprising. Um, well, I mean, more accountable in the sense that I think that they uh, now feel they have to explain themselves, explain decisions to a greater extent. Uh, they uh, they feel the need to uh, um, uh, be more accessible in a different kind of way. Uh, they, uh, it, it all, th there's all sorts of sm quite small things that add up to a significant shift. Uh, uh, you know, they, they can't behave in the same. I mean, if Mao was an emperor, uh, in a way he was an emperor, uh, just the latest emperor, uh, and Deng Xiaoping, you know, the paramount leader. I mean, this this had no constitutional status whatsoever, but he was regarded as the paramount leader. In other words, because he only had one position actually uh, 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 towards the end of his time. Um, uh, now, Hu Jintao is not an emperor, and Jiang Zemin was not an emperor. So there is a sort of, that's why I say there's been a much greater institutionalization of roles. That's important because, uh, you know, arbitrary, before there was a lot of arbitrary power. One INSEAD professor argues that um, we will not see China uh, progressing beyond, say, 12,000 US uh, per capita in China um, until there are certain reforms uh, carried out in China, whether it be rule of law, uh, participation, representative government, um, and so on. Would, would you see that as being a, a major obstacle? Well, I know the argument because it's not just, you know, that other people have argued this. Um, no, I don't agree with this. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, what is it, some kind of rule of thumb uh, that is derived from the experience of other countries? Um, uh, I think, you know, you've got to look at Chinese circumstances and uh, I think, uh, you know, that it will... Uh, that there, there won't be any arbitrary ceilings like that on, in Chinese development. It's more, it's, more, it's more complex than that. But I think with the process of development, it will become more open and representative. And exactly what forms that will take at each stage is difficult to say. I mean, you know, 
independent judiciary, or the, ru the rule of law requires, the rule of law would require major reforms in the position of the Communist Party. I think that will happen at some point. But when it will happen, I find it difficult to know. I think it, that is probably linked to, um, uh, to when uh, the present phase of, of modernization is concluded. You've got to, we've got to remember that China, you know, uh, spectacular as its growth is, or has been, is still really not much more than halfway through the process of its industrial revolution or economic takeoff or whatever term you want to describe. Still, you know, pushing half the population live in the countryside. So the great sort of spur for this growth has been the shift of labor from the countryside to the cities. And it's still got a long way to run. That's why people who say, well, you know, what, when will Chinese, you know, maybe we're reaching the limits of Chinese growth or maybe it'll hit a Japanese constraint. No, that's wrong because we're not in that situation. China is still very much a developing country and still, for the most part, a very poor country. And at the moment, as you say, it's a mix between develop developing very much still developing. It's developing, really. I mean, that there, uh, there are what I call very small pockets of where you could say, ah, oh, that, you know, it feels like a developed country. Uh, uh, in Beijing, uh, in uh, Shanghai, in Shenzhen, and in Guangzhou, and so on. Um, but these are tiny pockets uh, in uh, uh, a country which otherwise is uh, still uh, a very, very overwhelming a developing country. We should never lose sight of that. It seems to me that when people talk about China overtaking the US, it's almost this um, idea that the US is going to stand still, almost. Um, I mean, we're seeing f reasonably flat growth at the moment uh, due to the recession. But the, one major advantage the US probably has is its um, innovation. Hmm. and technological innovation. Hmm. Can China surpass that? Well, in the short run, the answer is definitely no, uh, because essentially what China's engaged in is what the Asian tigers were engaged in for a long time, which is catch-up. So essentially, it's, uh, it's an imitative economy, which is uh, learning and borrowing from outside, which uh, uh, in itself, of course, is, can be innovative, because to know how to copy and know what to copy and know how to make shortcuts is an innovative exercise in itself. So there's no sort of um, uh, brick wall between, between uh, uh, being catch up and then becoming uh, uh, an innovative economy in the way that, say, a developed, you know, the, the top Western or Japanese economy uh, is. Um, the thing is that the reason for China catching the United States is the disparity in their growth rates. It's not that the United States has somehow reached, um, is now a, a, a sort of a sclerotic economy or has reached a condition of stagnation or something like that. No, that's not, that is not the situation, although it's got deep problems, deep structural problems. But it's the disparity in the growth rate. China is likely to carry on growing, if not of its present growth rate, still a very formidable growth rate and the American economy is likely to carry on growing at uh, a, a, a relatively low growth rate, maybe lower than it's we've been witnessed in recent years, but relatively low anyway. And that's the reason for, for that situation. Um, and when the Chinese economy overtakes the American economy in 2027, or even when in 2050, let's say, uh, it is twice the size, it will still be much poorer than the United States. I mean, even in 2050, it's likely that the income per head in China will be roughly half that of the United States. So you'll have a very complex economy then, which combines both the characteristics of a developed country and a developing country. But that will also include China increasingly developing some kind of serious research capacity and so on. You can see this already just in areas like nanotechnology, where China is a leader. And, it, and it's quite likely in um, alternative forms of energy, solar power, for example. You, China will become quite a formidable player in those kind of areas. But they'll still be very small sections of the economy, given the size, its overall size. And what about the impact of India, then? Um, in the book, I don't get a sense of you know 
the other Asian giant in the wings, also growing very rapidly in terms of its economy. Yep. Um, it will have political military clout. Yep, absolutely. I mean, we're moving into a very different kind of world where, uh, I mean, the book is about China. China is undoubtedly the most important of the developing countries. Uh, it's three times the size of the Indian economy. Uh, on the Goldman Sachs project projection, it will be twice, the Chinese economy will still be twice the size of the Indian economy in 2050. So China still is very much the key, but that's got to be set against a picture, a background of a world where the developing countries are becoming increasingly important. You know, the, the shift from the developed to the developing economies in uh, 2050, projection is that in the top 10, apart from China, India will include Brazil um, and, uh, and Indonesia and Mexico. Uh, uh, for for example, so the the complexion of the world economy will be and the world polity will be very different will become very different because apart from China um, you'll have quite new uh, uh, players of some uh, 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 formidable players in the case uh, particularly of India but also uh, Brazil and so on and. The, these, the, this is going to be, these are, these are very profound and important changes. It seems to be difficult to kind of make hard and fast predictions because I remember um, 96, 97, there were books coming out about this is the age of the Pacific, the age of East Asian tigers, then we had the financial crisis in Asia. Um, a year or so ago there were books, or a few years back there were books about the collapse of China. It's there almost, was, there were, there almost was from every was, year, from year to year. This there was one book about the class. <laughs> one, one, Gordon Chang's book. Yeah. Difficult game predicting what's going to happen. Well, actually, uh, the Asian Tigers, uh, the story of the Asian Tigers remains a, 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 gr a great story. Um, the, the, the West has always been uh, basically uh, 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 doomsmiths about um, uh, Asian tigers. They were always saying, oh, you know, it's about to come to an end, or this is the crisis, or they won't be able to carry on growing like this, and so on. Or when the Asian financial crisis came along, you know, we told you so, you know, it, it can't last. On the contrary, they recovered very quickly from the Asian financial crisis. They did resume very rapid growth. The region has been continued to be extremely successful. The one exception to this story is Japan, since the, the late 80s. But in terms of the Asian fine, uh, the Tigers, this, this, the, 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 you know, they've been proved that their success is extended. It's been, it's been uh, affirmed and reaffirmed. Um, and uh, well, China people have been, you know, uh, there's been a profound skepticism about uh, China ever since uh, the growth period started in at the end of the 70s, early 80s, um, and then at Tiananmen Square and so on, and then people felt it put maybe come to an end now, and then, and then um, you know, during the people are predicting this will go wrong and that will go wrong, but, you know, excuse me, but 30 years of growth, of double-digit growth, is, m means that China's already changed very profoundly. So 30 uh, years of stability, we've seen. 30 years of stability, yeah, despite uh, despite Tiananmen Square, 30 years of basic stability, and um, so this is a formidable achievement. So I think that that um, the the, port, the 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 sort of the, the prophets of doom, the deep skepticism that's um, that's existed in certain quarters in the West, you know, they've been confounded. Maybe they'll be right one day, but they, so far they've been confounded. They've not been proved right, um, and. Uh, and at some point, you know, you've got to say, well, look, this has been a, a, this is a powerful historical trend. Um, and uh, the wor I mean, now everyone is talking, actually. Everyone is talking about the shift of power from uh, west to east. I mean, not just those who followed it or have some kind of professional relationship to it, but the people in the street are now recognizing in the west that this is, the, you know, this is happening. And the... Uh, uh, global financial crisis, of course, has dramatized this. 
because the contrasting fortunes between particularly China on the one hand and, um, and the United States on the other underline this. And already, I mean, there was a rather good article in The Economist the other week about um, <coughs> the, the very rapid bounce back of the Asian tigers after the Asian after this global financial crisis, you know, the, the feeling was they've lost their Western export markets and they'll be very uh, crippled as a consequence. Um, but there is obviously a big decoupling effect taking place. So uh, uh, East Asia is no longer nearly as dependent on the Western economy as it used to be, and Western S export markets and the United States market in particular. So. Uh, it seems to me, you know, now is n now it's too late to say this isn't happening because it's already happened. There's an interesting uh, passage in your book, and I, I won't uh, ask you which page it's on. It's near. The, it's actually near the end. Um, you say the Western world is over. The new world, for at least the next the next century, will not be Chinese in the way that the previous one was Western. We're entering an era of competing modernity, um, albeit one in which China will be increasingly in the ascendant and eventually dominant, um, which is a pretty strong statement uh, to make. Um, in terms of the, this competing modernity, presumably we're going to see China taking more of a role on the international stage and trying to um, have a greater voice in what would be the G20, I suppose rather than the G8, um, IMF, it may, it may get involved somehow in um, you know, financial regulations globally. How do, how do you see things progressing on that front? Well, I see, I see China becoming a bigger player, a, a bit of a reluctant player, actually, because it's still so preoccupied with its own development. I mean, the, its modernization, as I, I was saying, is still, uh, you know, uh, got a long way to go so it, uh, it's a very difficult and complex process, and th there's enormous problems. I mean, not. Th but when I say that, I don't mean uh, uh, problems that could bring the, the house down. But there are just in development uh, in a country as vast as China. It's a huge, hugely difficult process. So I think China is a reluctant player, but it will and is getting willy-nilly drawn into this process because it is already such a significant financial player in the world uh, for the reasons that I think we're uh, relative in the ways we're, we're relatively familiar with. I would expect, um, and I think we're witness, begin, witnessing the beginnings of um, the decline of America, the, the America as the, as, the, um, as the nation of sort of the exercises economic hegemony in the world. I mean, I, I think that part of the present crisis, actually, the origins of it lie in the inability of the United States any longer to be able to sustain and underwrite the international economic system of which it is the architect and patron. That is a deep problem. You know, the indebtedness means it cannot do it anymore, the multiple indebtedness. And, uh, um, and so uh, China is going to get drawn into this, situa this situation. Now, I personally, what I think will happen is that over time, th we're not talking short term now, but um, that the dollar will lose its reserve currency status in due course because it, 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 the American economy, America can no longer sustain that situation. Just like happened, if you like, earlier last century with Britain and the collapse of the gold standard system because Britain was too weak an economy eventually to be able to sustain it. And I think the same in due course is going to happen. Uh, with the United States, and you can already see the first signs of that situation. Um, and I think, in time, the most likely replacement will be the RMB as the as the reserve currency. And you can already, but one thing, thing things you can already see is, you know, uh, very apparent is that there were two chief, two main financial institutions of the American economic order that we've lived lived in for uh, half a century or so. One was the IMF, and the other was the World Bank. The IMF is much weaker than it used to be. Um, and it's a problematic institution because where is it going to get its money from? Well, actually, increasingly it needs to get its money from countries like China because they're the countries with the, you know, Asian countries are the ones with the biggest reserves. But with 2.4% or whatever it is, roughly 2.4% of the vote, why would China stick, stick serious sums of money 
into an institution over which it has virtually no control. It's not going to do it. It's, it, it has. It did give something on the uh, after the last G20, but and it's just paid the money in on notice. But uh, it is. Um, uh, uh, it's not. It, it is. An, it is an America. It's still an American stroke Western institution, and serves those interests. And it is of a weakening, import, uh, uh, di much diminished importance compared to what it used to be. In other words, one of the fundamental institutions of that order is now uh, much, uh, um, of much diminished strength compared to what it used to be. Likewise, the World Bank. I mean, the w if you take Africa, the size of chain Chinese loans and aid to Africa exceeds that made by the World Bank. So you can already see, if you like, a shift taking place just the beginnings of it in the way in which the international economic order uh, works. And I would expect that process to continue, um, probably accelerate actually. Um, and the, the Chinese are taking the first steps to making the RMB a convertible currency. Um, and I think in this region, for example, it's very like that it likely that over time a lot of trade will take place in, 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 in the RMB, not the dollar. Um, and that's you know that's a, again. It's, 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 what one, I think one's got to see this as a sort of um, a multiplicity of processes that will go on in lots of different in ways in different parts of the world, which will t collectively erode the existing system. And I mean, so the outcome. What what will the outcome be? Well, the outcome uh, could be quite quite. Um, Varied. I mean, one possible one possible outcome you c that, that is conceivable, but I think personally rather unlikely, is that basically the existing system is reformed, the IMS is reformed, uh, it becomes a proper representative institution. The United States power gives way to Chinese power in the long run. You know, developing or put it another way, the developing countries become the key players over time in it, and so on. Likewise, the World Bank. That's a possible scenario. But personally, I think there'll be so much resistance, Western resistance to it, European resistance. Europe, Europe has been, smaller country, Europe being very resistant to any reform of the IMF. I think that is, I think what's, I think the Chinese will participate and so on in that, but they'll have other eggs in their basket. Um, so I, know, I think new institutional forms will arise, probably initially on a regional basis, that begin to take on some of those, some of the roles of the traditional institutions. So you might get a twin track uh, uh, change taking place, slow reform of the existing institutions, emergence of new institutions. But ultimately, there will be in some new kind of institutional framework. The problem is that these kind of changes are uh, complicated, uh, extremely conflictual, because uh, being the dominant financial power carries with it enormous advantages and interests. So the United States will resist very strongly these processes, just as Britain resisted them, and fought for a long time to, to try and hold on to its role, because the role is a very profitable role. Um, and, uh, but, and it will take a long time, because um, uh, China's not in a position to assume uh, the kind of role that the United States has played, because it's a developing country. This is a completely new situation. In the past, um, transfers of power in the industri industrial era, since you know, since the early nineteenth um, century, have always been between relatively developed countries. But China isn't a developed country; it's a developing country more than a developed country. It's a uh, colonized, as you as you say in the book. It's uh, we're moving from the colonizers to the colonized. Well, that's another um, that's power. another shade of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that's but very in terms, interesting. Yeah. In terms of the military, though, the military aspect is China going to become a military superpower? Uh, I, I I think in time the answer's got uh, surely got to be yes to that. Um, you know, it goes with the territory. If you become a great global power, part of the way in which you project your power and protect your interests is having military capability. Um, so I'd be very surprised if China doesn't become uh, a, a formidable military power. Um, but we'd have to sort of, it, you'd have to say that that's not been important to the Chinese leadership so far, because actually military expenditure, until at least recently, 
fell as a proportion of GDP uh, post uh, the economic reforms of 1978 because China concentrated its resources on economic development and was wisely not distracted by uh, military adventures and military expenditure. Um, so, you know, compared to the United States, China still spends a fraction of the money uh, on uh, on military uh, on military ends. Well, I think he said yesterday in a talk that it doesn't even have an aircraft carrier at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. seems, and I think Britain's just surprising. ordered three. So, <laughs> but it, but it does have um, from time to time you see a flare up of nationalism in China, maybe over Taiwan, but you, you do see that occasionally. There have been border disputes with Russia, Vietnam, and so on. There's a lot of things in there. Uh, <laughs> the the border disputes that China's had were basically in the Mao period, uh, India, the war, uh, the war with the Soviet Union over the border. Um, the, the big exception to this, the, the only exception I can immediately think of is Vietnam, which was a war conducted by Deng Xiaoping. Um, and, uh, but by and large, apart from that, I mean, I don't mean that doesn't matter and isn't significant, I think it is, but um, by and large, since then, China's made a big effort to try and resolve its border disputes uh, peaceably. I mean, there were complex problems these borders, you know, because they were they were still really a, a kind of legacy of the Middle Kingdom, and uh, and they, they're vast, um, and you know, some of the borders would, you know, like the in, the, the Sino-Indian border, you know, the British were really responsible for it, so. Um, uh, so it was a complicated process, but they have made very a uh, big headway, big headway uh, in seeking uh, in seeking to uh, uh, sort them out. Well, it's an interesting book, um, and it, it's interesting to look at China's development from a Chinese Asian perspective rather than a, a Western one. Martin Jakes, uh, author of When China Rules the World, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.